Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. The program is brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Our guest tonight will be a Houston attorney, Barbara Ashley. But before Barbara and I start discussing some of the issues, uh, it's time for a little recap of what's hot around the world of drug reform currently. I think for those of us here in Houston, probably the hot news of the current week is the turmoil in the Harris County District Attorney's Office. Uh, because of some problems with a federal civil rights lawsuit and then following that some relevations about the district attorney's computer. Longtime district attorney Chuck Rosenthal has withdrawn from the Republican primary ballot this spring, leaving the Harris County District Attorney's Office wide open for the elections this fall. It promises to be a rather interesting campaign. Uh, on the national front, the campaign primary series for the presidential elections has broken loose with results from Iowa and New Hampshire now. Uh, probably the most startling thing about both of those contests has been the extremely high voter turnout, uh, particularly among young people and independent voters. So this promises to uh, open the ground for a lot of different activities. I also want to call your attention to an article that has just been published in the December-January issue of Scientific American Mind. This article, Psychedelic Healing, is a news story report about current research in the use of psychedelic drugs in uh, psychotherapy. Uh, while it's a very balanced, unbiased article, the results are overwhelmingly in favor of, are showing favorable outcomes in the use of several substances, including MDMA or ecstasy. It also includes a fairly decent uh, historical retrospective looking at the many, many, many published medical studies on LSD in particular from the 1950s and 60s. I strongly recommend that uh, you read this article, you show it to all of your friends, and I think it would be a good idea for a copy of it to show up on the desk of every elected representative in this country. I believe we now have our old friend Dean Becker on the phone to tell us more about what's going on. Hello, Dean, are you there? Hi, Buford. Uh, it's good to see you. I uh, um, wanted to share a couple of things with you. I'm okay. uh, most excited about my new website, okay. which is uh, redesigned, it should, I should say. It's at drugtruth.net, and uh, it's now providing the ability to do searches, to uh, select shows by guest name, by organization, and, and other means. And we're also now including transcripts of our full half-hour programs available online so folks could use them to uh, quote uh, perhaps within a letter to the editor or an op-ed. Well, I think it's great, Dean, that you're building up enough of a library and collection of past shows that you need a search engine to find your way through them now. Well, yeah, that's true enough. Uh, I also wanted to point out, I, I thought we had a couple of good shows in these past two days. Folks can, again, uh, tune into them uh, already at drugtruth.net. Yesterday we had Mr. Emery, he's the gentleman, uh, the publisher of Cannabis Culture Magazine up in Canada, who was uh, indicted by the United States for selling marijuana seeds to Americans, sending them across the border. They want to extradite him to face a potential uh, decade, if not a life sentence here in the U.S. for selling those seeds, calling him the largest drug kingpin in Canada. <laughs> Uh, work, if you will. Yeah. And then uh, today we had Allison Chen Holcomb of the ACLU in uh, Washington uh, talking about the marijuana laws, their uh, negotiations, if you will, with the uh, uh, city council and the mayor up there trying to redefine and redirect their efforts to stop arresting adults for possession of marijuana. 
And, and perhaps the most important story I've, I've covered in a while, at least I think it has a large impact, was a story that broke uh, at a uh, uh, federal prison up in Ohio where these prisoners had been busting apart computers to salvage the parts uh, for uh, recycling, I guess, in some cases. And uh, what has happened is over the years they've been exposed to lead and cadmium, which is released when they break these computers apart. Uh, it never would have come to light, he said. The guards finally realized they were at risk as well, and they began filing lawsuits in that regard. And uh, we, we have uh, uh, online there available uh, discussions with Karen Garrison. She has two sons who were sentenced to mandatory minimums for 15 and 19 years uh, on conspiracy charges. They never had any. When they were arrested, they had no drugs, no money, no guns. But uh, they were convicted on the word of the man who was actually caught with the, the guns. And, and the drugs, and he got three years, they got 15 and 19. But her son Lawrence was uh, in this prison in Ohio, and for seven years he's been working with that cadmium. And we also hear from uh, Mr. Paul Wright. He's the publisher of Prison Legal News talking about this. Prison Legal News has done quite a uh, bit of extensive coverage of this situation, and I want to put in a plug for them. Their, their website is prisonlegalnews.com. Uh, dot org and, and folks can uh, learn more about it there. But I, I think we, we also saw, I believe it was this morning, I saw a report from Great Britain that uh, Gordon Brown is trying to once again change their marijuana laws to move it from a Class C, which is I think their lowest designation, back to a Class B so that they can arrest people and uh, jail them for minor amounts of marijuana. And it just shows that this reefer madness will never die unless enough people uh, realize the need for change and do their part to help bring it to an end. Okay, before you go, Dean, I think there's one other uh, major breakthrough in illegal drugs that, that we need to mention, and this is the Roger Clements case, uh, where Roger has been accused of using illegal steroids in his baseball career. And I think one reason I want to bring it up is in light with what you just mentioned with the prison conspiracy cases. Here's a case in which the only evidence apparently against Roger is a statement by his trainer who is uh, facing possible federal indictment for his distribution of steroids and who has said that He's done what he's done so far because he didn't want to go to jail. Uh, it's amazing how many of these convictions are based upon really the uncorroborated word of someone who's under intense pressure from prosecutors to make a statement and drop the dime on someone else. I, I, I agree with you that it's a, it's a terrible situation that he has himself in. As you say, for the, the people caught with drugs, they, they want to turn in other people so they can at least reduce their sentence, if not eliminate it altogether. But from my perspective, I mean, Roger Clemens um, supposedly did these uh, drugs a few times, but I, I don't think um, it's really our business. That's, that's my thought on this. That If you look back in time prior to the, the time that Major League Sports began, uh, conducting these tests, doing these uh, evaluations of what people put into their body. I mean, you go back in time, uh, Mickey Mantle could have been using uh, methamphetamine and uh, uh, Babe Ruth could have been using cocaine, and, and no one would have cared. No one did, in fact, care. It, it is, uh, all of this, this hoopla is a result of uh, the American mindset is that we have to monitor what other people do so that they um, quote, don't have an unfair advantage in life, though I don't think these drugs uh, in particular give us that advantage, certainly not for a long and healthy life. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dean. And can you tell us once again where on the radio we can find you? Uh, you can uh, hear my shows on uh, KPFT Houston, which is 90.1 FM. Uh, we're on some 50-plus stations in the U.S. and Canada. And uh, you can uh, tune in to all my shows. Hundreds of them are now available on that newly redesigned website at drugtruth.net. Okay, thank you, Dean. And our visitor tonight is a local attorney, Barbara Ashley. 
She is living the life of a sole practitioner, which I can tell you from personal experience is a hard but interesting way to do things. She has a daughter who's a college student and recently who recently wrote a paper on legalizing marijuana. So uh, glad to have you here tonight, Barbara. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, how have you gotten interested in drug laws? Well, I got interested in them back in, I'd say, the early 70s when I saw people getting arrested for marijuana and treated like, you know, they were just hardened criminals, and it just seemed so ridiculous to me. And that's when I first got involved with Normal, a national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. And um, I think they do great work, and right now what we're seeing in the political arena with the caucuses and the primaries going on, uh, I'd like to bring that to people's attention that we can make a difference as far as these drug laws go. We can all go to our own caucuses here that will occur. We'll have a primary on Tuesday, March 4th. And if you come back to the place where you vote at 7 o'clock that evening and have a convention, then you can caucus and you can bring resolutions. So you can, for example, maybe write a resolution to legalize marijuana okay. or for let, medical let, marijuana. Let me slow, down, slow you down here a bit and maybe fill the people in a little bit more about the mechanics of what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, in Texas, each party has their own separate party primary and they're on the same day. Yes. So that Republicans vote in one set of ballots are voting machines and Democrats in another, sometimes at the same place, sometimes different places. Correct. Then at the end of the voting day, each party in each precinct has its own precinct convention. Correct. They elect representatives to go to the county conventions and they pass resolutions to be considered by the county convention to go into the county platform. Yes, or it may be a Senate district. Like in Houston, we're so big. We have such a big county that right. it goes from the precinct to the Senate senatorial district. Senatorial district rather than county. Yes. Then at the, the senatorial district or county level, there's a convention later in the spring which takes all of these representatives from the precinct, selects the representatives from that district to go to the state convention, and also considers possible resolutions are party plank, platform planks that have been forwarded from the precincts. Correct. And then the third level is the state convention, which does the same thing to select the delegates to the national party convention. Yes. Okay. So you have us now hanging around after coming back after the voting closes to go to the precinct convention. Uh, how, do they, how do these meetings work? Well, at 7 o'clock, that's when everybody shows up for the precinct convention. And it's important to be on time, bring your resolutions, have them already written. And Normal uh, probably has some that we've worked on in past years that we could work with. Um, uh, because quite often they revise them at the different levels. Now, by resolution, you mean something like a statement saying that we resolve that the state should legalize marijuana for medicinal purposes or... Yes. We resolve that the state should legalize uh, free needle exchange for intravenous drug users or, or, or whatever you want done. Correct. Yes. Yes. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here because if we get with the people, say, for example, with an organization that's been around a while, such as Normal, they probably have some of these resolutions that have already worked its way through the system in past years. Yeah. And so we could start with something that, you know, has already been written rather than trying to reinvent the wheel here. Well, my, but, my, my memory may mm -hmm. not be totally clear here, but, okay. but I'm thinking that in some recent years, uh, the Texas Democratic Party at the state level has actually adopted some of these resolutions on a statewide basis, haven't they? Yes, that's correct. And it's only through the efforts of organizations like Normal, and we used to have the uh, Texans for Medical Marijuana, yeah. but they really got organized ahead of time got their resolutions together, they tried to, you know, talk to people in these different precincts because, say for example, you have a resolution to legalize marijuana, well you want that to pass the same exact resolution in as many precincts as possible so that when you get to the upper levels, they won't be fighting over trying to revise it, they'll just go ahead and pass it, they'll say, well, 
we had, you know, 50 precincts that passed the same resolution to legalize marijuana. So we're going to go ahead and send that up to the state level. And sometimes we've had to actually really look at the party rules and make sure we had those down pat because sometimes people, it's like a chess game, sometimes people try to outmaneuver you, and especially in politics. And there's a lot of discussion about, well, this will hurt our chances of getting our people elected versus, well, we want the young people to come out and vote, and this is an issue they're very strong and adamant about. And uh, we need to stop and take a break, and we'll come back and talk about this some more. Okay. So we'll see you all in about a minute or two. My attitude is if the science and doctors suggest that the best palliative care, the best way to relieve pain and suffering is through medical marijuana, then that's something that I'm open to. And because there's no difference between that and morphine, when it comes to just giving people relief from pain. I'm not one that generally favors enlarging the uh, number of drugs that people have, particularly if there's a chance for abuse. Now, if a doctor prescribes and it is in a form like a pill or some type of a form that's not so much a recreational endeavor, um, I think that's a different discussion. Uh, I think we should be doing medical research on this. You know, we ought to find what are the elements that claim to be existing in um, marijuana that might help people who are suffering from cancer and nausea-related treatment. We ought to find that out. I don't, believe, I don't believe that medical marijuana is necessary for the uh, alleviating uh, pain, relief of pain. I don't believe it's healthy, and I don't believe that it is, and I believe that it is a national issue and not a statewide issue. There would be regulations, just like there are regulations on uh, alcohol for kids. So there's there's ways of handling this, and like I mentioned earlier, I just don't like the federal government coming in and, and deciding that states can't uh, allow individuals to use marijuana for medical reasons. That shouldn't be a, a federal function; it should be a state function. So. Uh, but if Watching drugs, crime, and politics on Houston Media Source. And we're back uh, with local attorney Barbara Ashley. We've been talking about uh, using the state party convention processes to adopt resolutions, particularly in this case affecting the drug laws, and we're talking about the need to get identical wording of resolutions submitted to precinct committees to be more effective. Uh, is there some place where people can go to find out the text of resolutions that have been introduced previously or that, that have been adopted in party platforms before? Uh, the Progressive Action Alliance did have quite a few resolutions on different issues and their website is paa-tx.org perhaps they would still have some that have to do with drug policy reform and if not we hope to have them up there we'll have to get with Progressive Action Alliance about that and um, but I want to also ask people to really look at your rules you can get them off the party platform uh, the party website for the Democrats it's Harris County Democratic Party hcdp.org and it's real important to know the rules before you go to these conventions right. because sometimes people try to outmaneuver you like I'm, a chess game. I'm, I'm certain that the, the county Republicans have a website as well. Yeah, I'm sure they probably do. And I want to take mm -hmm. just a second to uh, remind people that our phone number is on the screen. Uh, we love to have you call in and contribute to the program by either asking questions or making comments. So uh, questions for either one or both of us. Okay. Okay. And oh, I want to mention one other thing before I forget that um, those rules are very important because even though we've had these resolutions pass a number of precincts and at different levels, when we've gotten to the state convention, we had to do what, what was called a petition 
where delegates, a certain percentage of delegates had to sign the petition to get the um, resolution voted on that had to do with medical marijuana because like I said, that chess game, sometimes people maneuver and they don't want to have it to a floor vote of all the delegates. So it's real important to know those rules before you get there. Yeah, on something like that, uh, isn't there a lead time of at least a few weeks between the district conventions and the state conventions so that, so that these things like circulating petitions can be done ahead of time? Not necessarily because the petitions have to take place at for example, with the state convention, yeah. it has to be right there, and it has to be the delegates that are right there in attendance oh. at that state convention. So you can't actually do it until the the delegates sign in. Okay. So you have a real short period of time to get that taken yeah. care of. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to go back to uh, something you said about uh, when you got involved, interested in drug laws mm -hmm. in the 1970s. Uh, and I actually started practicing law in 1970. And I, I know one of the things that, that kind of stuck in my craw at the time and that I still remember was that I was sitting in Lubbock where people were being convicted on felony charges, going to prison for multiple years, for possession of a very small amount of marijuana. Yet I would go down to Austin, go to a party thrown by a friend who was an assistant attorney general for the state, and they would pass around a plate full of joints for the party. I believe we have a caller. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes, so speaking national politics and drug reform. Okay. Uh, Ron Paul seems to be stuck in fifth place here. Uh, is it, what do you think are the, the possibilities of uh, his candidacy uh, and how it's affected? Would, uh, and uh, right now the only thing I can think of is uh, the possibility of what he would say at the convention if he indeed gets enough delegate votes to uh, qualify for prime time. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, I hate to be a wet blanket. Uh, I know a lot of my friends are enthusiastic here, but Ron Paul's kind of the Don Quixote of American politics. And... I think his campaign has about the same viability as a snowman on the streets of New Orleans in August. That there's just no way he's going to make a real run out of this. I sincerely doubt that he'll be invited to make any noise at all at the Republican convention. Now, I'm thinking here, and my thinking quite often can be wrong. What do you think about Ron Paul's chances, Barbara? Well, it does seem like they try to hush him up because he does have a lot of good ideas. But I was thinking, you know, if he has a chance to get out there in some of these debates, I know some of them have tried to exclude him, but hopefully that issue could be brought up while he's out here campaigning and debating. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that brings out something else is that as the campaign season heats up, uh, there are going to be all sorts of town meetings and uh, meet the candidate sessions and club meetings of different kinds. So there are all kinds of opportunities for citizens to show up, participate, speak, and, and tell people what's on their mind, bring some of these issues up. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and I think here, uh, I'm going to let you brag here for a minute. You were telling me about your daughter's doing a college paper on legalizing marijuana and that she seems to have made an impression not only on her teacher, but on some of her classmates. Uh, what kind of response did she get from classmates when she presented this paper? Well, I was really proud of her. My daughter, Elizabeth Ashley, she's in her first year of college. And uh, her English teacher, her English professor said he wanted them to write a paper and pick their own issue, but he didn't want anything boring. He said, I'm tired of hearing about abortion and the war in Iraq, and I want a controversial issue. So she wrote on the legalization of marijuana. And, of course, they have to use scholarly journals, and they have scholarly databases they use. And she had to also make a presentation in another class about herself. And she incorporated the legalization of marijuana as an issue that she was really concerned about. And her, her classmates, the tre tremendous, they had a tremendous response. 
I mean, they really perked up. They weren't bored in the classroom. They were all telling her what a great presentation she made. And the original paper she wrote for her English professor, he told her he thought she should have it published. So she's been very excited about her response. Yeah. Well, I, I think the point I was trying to make mm -hmm. is that uh, if you show up at, at one of these forums or meetings of some kind, and if you are careful and think about what you're saying, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the candidates you're talking to. It's all of the other citizens there in the room with you that with some luck you'll start them thinking and start them talking. Right. Mm -hmm. Democracy works sideways. It doesn't just mm -hmm. go up and down. Right. And then hopefully those people will in turn talk to their elected officials yeah. about the issues yeah. and how they feel about them. So well, uh, hopefully we can affect some change. Now that, that's something I keep repeating over and over and over, that Congress critters have to be reminded that you're, they're your hired hands, not your bosses. That's right. And it takes frequent, steady and firm communication from voters to politicians to get the point across. That's correct. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I know if, if we look at polling that takes place nationwide and in Texas, probably somewhere above 70 percent of voters are in favor of medical marijuana. Right. That's a big majority, yet Politicians seem to be afraid of it still. That's what I've noticed, but they really need to listen to their constituents. Yeah, yeah. and it, it's not, a th now there are some. There are, there are right-wing and religious nutcases in Congress and the legislature. There's no doubt about it. But I think most politicians are fairly reasonable about the merits of the case, but they're afraid to take an action that will hurt them when it comes to getting votes. Well, that's what I heard at the last state yeah. convention from some of the politicians, yeah. but not all of them, because some of them, uh, for example, Jim Darty, he's an attorney, and he's run for different spots, and he was saying he didn't think it would hurt our chances of having our people elected if we took a stand on medical marijuana. Oh, that's right, for the party, but what I'm talking about is the individual politician. Well, that's what I mean, for yeah. him to take that stand. Yeah. He didn't think it would hurt his chances yeah. of being elected, and that was the time when he was running for office. Yeah. And, yes, and I was very proud of him for speaking up. Right. Uh, part of that depends upon where the politician is running from. Mm -hmm. uh, Excuse me, but it's one thing to come out in favor of, say, medical marijuana if you're in San Francisco. It's another thing if you're in Lubbock, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's part of what we have to deal with, is that politicians almost never are ahead of their local people, and they're frequently behind them. That's true. <laughs> Well, with the primary now, too, we have, for example, on the Democratic side, we have, you know, Democrats running against Democrats right. in different areas. Yes. And then the same on the Republican side. And so, um, I mean, that's a, a good way to find out where people stand, too. Say, if you have five people in one spot running, you know, and you're interested in one issue, you want to find out which one of those people in those spots yeah. are, are concerned about that issue that you're concerned about. And then that would probably be the one you would back. I mean, looking at the totality of the circumstances. Well, well, um, that uh, that's a place where I'm in favor of being sneaky rather than confrontational. Uh, I think it's great if you can communicate with a possible candidate privately mm -hmm. to find out where they're standing. Mm -hmm. But if there's a candidate you think might be in favor of, say, medical marijuana, I very strongly suggest that you never ask him that question in public because, unfortunately, if he says, yes, I'm in favor in public, in many parts of this state at least, it will cost him votes. Even if it doesn't, he will be afraid enough that it will cost him votes. He'll probably hedge and quibble about his answer and sound silly. So, so you don't really have anything to gain by putting a candidate that you favor on the spot about it. Now, right. it's great, it's great mm -hmm. to pressure them privately. Mm -hmm. It's great to say things that work on the other voters in the room, but, but I still feel like that at the current state of politics in this country, it's a mistake to try to make an active candidate 
commit for you. Now, if you want to go to the other side and try to embarrass a real nutty drug warrior by making him say silly things in public, that's a different story. Uh, Unfortunately, we've got to take another break here. that America needs to reform its laws against marijuana. And you can do something about it by joining the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Check our website and get involved with the local chapter. If there isn't one in your area, start one. No one should go to prison for smoking a harmless flower. And sick people shouldn't be denied medicine for their illness. Together, we can change America for the better. Well, during the break, we got a question about uh, what actually do we mean by a precinct caucus? I mean, is this a great big elaborate event with lots of people and presiding chairman? And well, not usually. I mean, some precincts have a lot of people show up yeah. for their. It's called a convention when you come back to the precinct where you vote at seven o'clock that night yeah. um, on the March fourth primary night. You know, say, for example, if I go to my precinct and I vote in the Democratic primary, and that's where I go back to at 7 o'clock, and some precincts have a you know, number of people show up. Like in my precinct, sometimes I've been the only person to show up. Well, that's the thing. If, if we look at Houston, or Harris County part mm-hmm. of Houston, uh, we've got literally hundreds of, of precincts and polling places. So right. uh-huh. it may be that when you go to your precinct convention, it... Maybe you and two other people or even just you there. Right. And that's why I wanted to mention it tonight because a lot of people don't understand this or know about it. And I've even seen, like I'm a precinct judge, and I always tell all the voters when they come in, please come back at 7 for the precinct convention. But a lot of judges don't do that. And, in fact, I've even seen some of them try to discourage people because they want to hurry up and leave. Yeah. But, I mean, this is really important. And especially if you have an issue you're concerned about, you know, then, then you could start writing your resolutions now about your issues. Well, I think, I think that's, that's important to stress, is that it's a little over, it's about a month and a half now until the primaries. Yes. And uh, it's time to start thinking if you are going to participate, if you want to present a resolution, Start thinking about the wording and seeing that you can get it together with other people. If you want to try to become a delegate to the district or state conventions, you need to figure out when and where they're going to be to make sure it'll fit your schedule. Right. Uh huh. I mean, there's a, there's a some preparation you need to do for this. Oh yes, because you'd have to schedule it for your calendar. 
and then say if you want to go to the state convention or the national convention, um, you'd have to start saving some money because you have to pay for your transportation, your lodging, Correct. et cetera. And almost anybody that wants to go to the Senate convention can go, and the same with a state convention quite often. But national is very competitive. Right. So it's usually just a few people from uh, our area, say from our Senate district, that get to go to the national convention. And at the national level, uh, a lot of the delegates are either professional politicians or almost full-time party workers of some kind. Right. Uh -huh. at, at that level, it's not really the man on the street that participates. But, but at the, the county or district level and the state level, uh, it's it's still pretty much shirt sleeves popular democracy at work. Right, it is, and, that, and it's that's a lot in of both fun. parties. Yeah. Yes, uh huh. And it can be a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, we've had our conventions here in Houston, uh, in Fort Worth, El Paso, for, as far as state goes. Yeah. And when you go in there, they have caucuses for different issues, different groups. Uh, they have you know different kind of political paraphernalia um, organizations that you can yeah. check out or. Uh, different kind of clothing and buttons, all kind of things. Mm -hmm. But it can be a lot of fun. Oh yeah, if you're in, in uh, if you're a collector of any kind, uh -huh. uh, it's a great source of buttons and ribbons and coffee mugs and bumper stickers and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, right. But if you have any issues that you feel passionately about, you know that's why I would encourage you to write a resolution about it and go to your uh, well, precinct I think, convention. I think it's important to stress that if there's an issue that's important to you. The way to make it happen is to start making it part of the process early. Correct. That if you get a resolution started on primary voting day, then there's a chance that it becomes a part of the official party platform later in the year. It becomes an issue that the candidates at least have to give some consideration to, and it's at least on the table. Yeah, if you that's wait what until our point is. after the election in November, all you can do is say, well, why didn't that so-and-so do something about medical marijuana? Right. And usually it'll start with a resolution, and then we, when we go to the state convention, we have a uh, committee, a resolutions committee, and also at the, the Senate district level. And they'll work on all these different resolutions. And then they'll have another committee that works on the platform. And ideally, the resolutions that are passed should wind up in the platform. But quite often, the platform is more vague. And the resolutions are more detailed and pointed yeah. on a particular issue. Yeah, the, the, the party state platform might say something like, we're in favor of good health for everybody. Whereas the resolution would be more nitty-gritty about allowing medical marijuana or providing for needle exchange or, or something else. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and the platform it might, not, might not even use the words medical marijuana. It might just say something like you mentioned or yeah. that we support privacy between a doctor and his patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's important, too, is that even if you're only a consumer of politics instead of a creator of them, uh, is that you need to make yourself sensitive to these kinds of keywords. That privacy between patient and doctor can cover a whole lot of things. Uh, right. it, it was one of the bywords for a half a century for birth control and then abortion. Right. Now it covers medical marijuana, and I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't cover medical MDMA as well. But uh, you, 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 I think, I think the, the point I keep coming back to is that when it gets out to the actual voting day kind of politics, mealy mouth and broad generalities that don't say anything are going to be the order of the day. Right. That the candidates are going to get on television and talk about how much they're in favor of the flag, motherhood, and low-calorie apple pie. But they're not going to talk about what any of those things really mean. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so in uh, these years of practice, uh, what kinds of uh, 
drug war problems have you run into or what seems to be important to your way of thinking as a practicing lawyer? Well, uh, actually, this would tie in, I guess, to what you had mentioned in the article here about what I see a lot of. I do work in uh, the areas of criminal law, uh, juvenile law, special ed, family law. But what I see a lot of is people trying to medicate mental illness. And even if they're being treated by a doctor, quite often they don't like the side effects of these pharmaceuticals, right. so they'll turn to marijuana. Yeah, we have another caller. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Thanks for taking my call. My name is Robin, and I have a, a question relative to strategies regarding these um, resolutions. Okay, Robin. Um, let's say you had a group of people, um, and not sure whether, let's say the group is 20, let's say the group is several hundred people. Um, and the group could be within a city or the group could be across the state. Okay. But let's say you had the opportunity to mobilize those individuals. Which would be the better strategy to come up with a variety of resolutions that people could bring forth in their caucuses or to mobilize those individuals to identify a single resolution uh, that each one would bring forward um, so that... When you when you came forward at the end, um, you'd be bringing forward one message with that resolution, or is it a better strategy to say, for example, um, bring forward multiple messages? Say, for example, a resolution regarding um, shorter sentences, you know, jail time. Another okay. one regarding um, doctor-patient confidentiality. A third one regarding. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. Okay. You know, you can. You can yeah, take I think we're getting. Different types of I think we're getting. Sure you know them better than I do. Yeah. But I think you get the gist. Yeah. Uh, I, I really hear two questions in there. Uh, the first we talked a little bit about, but I'd like to hear more about it. And this is the idea that if you decide you won't say a medical marijuana resolution, the thing to do is try to get, as nearly as possible, the same wording coming out of every precinct. Right. The other is, uh, she listed a whole bunch of different things. If, if I can think of the ones I think of, we've got medical marijuana, we've got needle exchange, we've got uh, decriminalization of simple possession, we've got expanding and actually making useful the citation instead of arrest law. Uh, is it a better strategy this year to pick one of those and get all the effort behind it or to I would move suggest, forward on several fronts at once. I would suggest on the d the different individual ones because those are really different issues. Yeah. Yeah. But ha try to have as many people in as many precincts as possible to pass the same one. Because, see, say, for example, I'm in Senate District 6. Say if I have 100 precincts and 50 of them pass uh, resolutions uh, that are all, you know, say we have three resolutions and 50 of them pass all three. Well, when I get to that Senate District 6 uh, resolutions committee and I see, okay, we have these three resolutions, they were passed in 50 precincts, we're going to pass that pretty quick yeah. because they're all the same. And when we have our, our committee meeting, it's during our Senate District 6 convention, and we're only going to be there for a few hours. Okay. So we're not going to have time to tear apart each one of those resolutions and change them. Oh, not so that's why that. I'm saying the strategy yeah. of having them all the same from as many precincts as possible, you know, we could say, okay, well, we have 50 to legalize marijuana. Do I hear a, a motion to pass? Okay, so we'll pass them all without changing them. So we can get those through quick. Well, in, in a place like Harris County with Senate District 6, so mm -hmm. on the Democratic side, how many resolutions would, would a committee have to deal with to just to start through. I mean, is it well, five seen, or six or is it a Oh, no, I've minutes? seen boxes come in. And that's why I'm saying if you're in there for just a few hours and you have a box that's got hundreds of resolutions in it, they're all different, there's no way you're going to be able to no. look at all of them. So that if, if you want something that says medical marijuana, mm -hmm. the whole resolution, uh, the whole set of resolutions ought to be worded the same. Right, to save time and, for, yeah. and then hopefully that would be passed. Yeah. Because, see, the chair of that resolutions committee would get that box ahead of time, and they could organize it. They could say, well, okay, I have 50 of these medical marijuanas here. They're all the same. So since I have more of that than I have of anything else, we're going to present that one first. Yeah. 
to the committee because you have to look you have a very short time span there. right and if one said medical marijuana and a second one said patients right to medicinal herbs uh, the committee would treat those as two different resolutions not both medical marijuana right yeah. most likely sometimes they'll they'll group similar ones together but then they'll they'll deal with them separately so that takes yeah. up more time because yeah. they're not the same right now uh, it's time for another break, and we'll be back again in a minute or two. That's not what we did, but not quite. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes when we have a problem, we only use one tool. It works pretty good most of the time, so we keep on using it. Pretty soon, when your only tool is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. With prisons overflowing with nonviolent drug offenders, it's time to try some new tools. Drug prohibitionists beat the drum for more jail time, but that has been a self-defeating policy. If someone has a problem with drugs, they need medical help, not incarceration. The drug war is doing more harm than good, and it's time for a change. By reducing the consequences of prohibition, we can deal with the real issues involved in a rational drug policy. There are better tools. If you would like to help reduce the harm caused by the drug war, please visit our website at dpft.org. Okay, maybe a little of the money I spend on marijuana supports terror and violence. Right. And uh, that's because marijuana is illegal. Exactly. When I buy a beer, that doesn't support terror because beer is legal, right? Now you've got it. So what you're saying is if we make marijuana legal and regulate it like beer, that wouldn't support violence. Did I say that? First, I want to remind everyone that the Drug Policy Forum of Texas will hold its annual meeting here in Houston next Wednesday night, that's a week from tonight, at 7.30 p.m. at the Cafe Express on West Gray Street in Houston. And that's on the north side of West Gray, about halfway between Montrose and Shepard. Uh, I don't have the exact address with me. Uh, but the information is on the DF, DPFT website, that's dpft.org, and that's the annual meeting next Wednesday at 7.30, Cafe Express on West Gray. Uh, and we were talking about the, the tactics of putting resolutions together, and I think one thing that, that uh, might be said and this is something where you might have to turn to your daughter for help uh, because some of us old gray beards aren't as, as up on this but with the freely available methods of farming blogs of setting up controlled uh, communications pages on some of the social networking sites where you can limit the people that get in to just your friends uh, you can very easily in a matter of minutes set up a group across your city or even across the whole state or even across the whole nation to get together and talk about and hash these things out and coordinate your plans on them and and organizations important oh yes it is mm -hmm. so and as i say uh don't ask me to help you set up a myspace page but i bet you've got a kid somewhere around that can help you on it uh yeah, and the Progressive Action Alliance did a great job last time on uh, getting different resolutions on the Internet for people to uh, take to their precinct conventions right. regarding yeah. different issues. And that there are lots of reform groups out there mm -hmm. that maintain some sort of a web presence. I know uh, uh, DPFT has a website. Houston Normal has one. Texas Normal has one, National Normal has one, I believe Dallas Normal has one. Uh, 
Uh, can you think of any other here in the state that are direct or directly related to any of the drug issues? Uh, I, think, uh, I think you made a good list there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if uh, Texans for Medical Marijuana is still an active site or not. Uh, they lost a lot of their funding this year, but... Uh, yes, I believe they had a grant from uh, probably the, um, let's see, Marijuana Policy Project. Yeah. So they may have something on their website, MPP. Yeah. And, then, uh, and, of course, nationwide, there's MPP and MAPS and uh, the, the National Normal Site. Uh, and all of these places have a lot of information that's available. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk a little bit this evening about the district attorney. Uh, across the United States, the district attorney is one of the most imparted important elected officials we have. He probably has more totally unbridled discretion in his power than any other federal official, more than the president, more than the governor. And he is not subject to any of the traditional checks and balances. So the election of a district attorney may be the most crucial vote that voters can take. Now, the district attorney in local politics, at least, some of the discretionary issues that are of interest to our viewers would include medical marijuana. Our current district attorney is against it. Needle exchange. He has refused to allow even informal ones in Harris County. The use of citations rather than arrest in simple drug possession cases. He has snorted and said that, well, if they don't arrest them, I'm not going to prosecute them. The result is Harris County has not moved forward on it. We have the issues of jail overcrowding because of excessive sentences on drug cases. And the same thing at the statewide level. All of these are things that some district attorneys across the state have done differently within their discretionary powers. For this coming election, it seems to be wide open with both parties fielding candidates, no one particularly with an incumbent's advantage. I suspect it's going to be a rather lively campaign. And it's a campaign that should touch on many issues. So this campaign, possibly more than any we have seen for several years, gives each of us a chance to call issues we're concerned about to the public attention. Since you can tie the issue of medical marijuana to the district attorney's election, that makes it a more logical letter to the editor for the paper to publish. Since you can tie jail overcrowding to the district attorney, you're probably going to get a more ready ear if you speak at the service club you're a member of, or even at one of your church gatherings. So the fact that we have an open district attorney's race gives all of us a chance in this city and county at least to push issues that are of concern to us to the front of the table to get other people talking about them as well and possibly to accomplish some reform. And, and this is true no matter which party or which candidate you favor. These are still issues that should be discussed. It's time to become active in talking about it and getting our neighbors thinking about these issues as well. So an opportunity is open to us. The door is wide enough. We can wedge our foot in it. 
it's time to push a little bit harder and get some people to take notice of what we're doing. Uh, <coughs> okay. It, I believe the cold front that came through brought some new pollen and things with it, and I've, I've been having some trouble myself tonight. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, anything in particular you want to say in closing? Pardon me. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll say another couple of things here. Uh, first, one of the things that uh, has surprised a lot of people on the national level with the political season opening up is in looking at Iowa and New Hampshire, the, the total number of participating voters has been much, much higher than anyone had anticipated that we have uh, large numbers of first-time voters and young voters appearing in both of these states. And we have independent voters participating in both of them. So, so what seems to be happening, for whatever reason, whether it's because Obama is a charismatic figure, or it's because everyone's fed up with the war, or whether simply Santa Claus brought everyone political spirit for Christmas. I don't know what the reasons are, but for some reason, the elections this year seem to have attracted voter attention. This seems to be the year that lots and lots and lots of people are going to participate in the political and electoral process. Uh, I think it's it's awfully early to try to predict outcomes, but I think that the process this year is going to be more open than it's been in any number of years. We're going to get more new voters participating, which means that it's a good time to start talking to start bringing our concerns to these new people. And guess what? The polls show that young voters who seem to be showing up so far are much more in favor of medical marijuana, much more in favor of decriminalizing or even legalizing marijuana than are the older folks. So, uh, we may be facing our year of opportunity here. So I guess my concluding message tonight, I'd like to thank Barbara for being with us, but remember once again, I'm happy that some of you called in tonight. You do participate in our show and make it happen. But remember, it's much, much more important if you call or write or better go visit in person your elected representatives and tell them what's important. Thank you, and I hope we'll see you all back again at our next show. I'm Buford Terrell wishing you a good night. of drug prohibition is hopeless. It is hopeless. It will never get better. Literally, victory today is being defined as slowing down the pace of defeat. We ought to listen to 